It's Sunday night, 9 o'clock. Welcome to All Across Live. I'm Gary Groove in Toronto, and I just got here. <laughs> Another week of travel, guys. Another big week of travel. We'll get into that in a second. With me, of course, I have Sean Slatt and Moose Jaw. How are you, Sean? Doing pretty good. Thanks, Gary. And I have Muffler Mike over in Connecticut with a nice Seals jersey on his door. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Saw a lot of that a couple of weeks ago. Yep. <laughs> How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing good. Awesome. Yeah, guys, um, nothing like having a good old six-hour drive to Albany and a six-hour drive back in the last uh, 24, 35 hours or so. Um, that's always fun. It's a good time, though. I uh, I really enjoyed the uh, the atmosphere, the people, the, the arena. You know, there's a lot of really good stuff going on there. They seem to got that down pat, and there were more people there than I thought there were going to be. So... And yeah, there was a number of rock fans that were there, but uh, uh, that's mostly uh, Albany fans and uh, pretty cool stuff. Now, one of the things which was my highlight of the weekend is I had a chance to uh, to get together with Brent Coy. And we've had Brent on the show, uh, showing refurbished sticks and things like that. And I got a chance to see a bunch of those as well. But um, we all know his, uh, his NLL or MILL accomplishments with the New York Saints. He had tried out for the Albany attack, and uh, this isn't or isn't one of those uh, pre-made shirts that were at the arena. This is his. So thank you, Brent. Uh, it's awesome. found a good home. This That's is awesome. Uh, awesome. Uh, he gave me a few other things. He gave me uh, uh, one of the old Albany attack T-shirts. This is the back of it. On the front, there's a big A on the side. Um, he uh, also uh, uh, threw in a, uh, an Albany attack cap from way back. But it didn't stop there. He had a couple of other things in there that were really interesting things, too. The NLL had come out with a uh, an official publication back 2000, 2001. And this was a standard thing for all the uh, all the teams because it had all the teams in the back of this uh, this thing. But uh, in the center, uh, the teams could put their own stuff in there. And obviously, this was Albany's because uh, there's their teams. So a really cool thing to, to go through and have a look at. He had given me from uh, the 2001 season, their number one pick was Mike Regan. And uh, DeBeer Lacrosse had put out a picture, which uh, Mike had uh, signed. Really Sweet. Cool. And uh, if I wanted season tickets for the 2001-2002 season, well, over at the uh, MVP arena, which then was called Pepsi Arena, and then there was, of course, everything you needed, your schedule and your seating guide and everything else and all the new things that they were going to do like season ticket giveaways and all kinds of other things to keep the fans a blazing in there but um yeah it was great to, to meet up with him um a couple of little shots there of course us in the uh the um pub which was attached to my hotel which did a lot of uh sponsors for the albany um team which was really cool and uh if you're ever in albany uh, head over to the Hilton Garden in uh, Albany Medical Center. Uh, this bar is attached to it. The food was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. And uh, atmosphere, people, service, everything was great. Everything I read about it was that and more. Just amazing. But we went out and looked at um, He had brought a couple of sticks both days, uh, yesterday and today. And uh, today, this was a picture with uh, one of the Alfie sticks. Um, just, just amazing. And, you know, I have been to Alfie's workshop. I have sat down, had dinner with Alfie and, you know, all through, through the years and um, went to, uh, seen him put together things in a 10-month process. But to have the stick in your hand compared to other sticks, the thing is just weighted so perfectly that it's just, it's such a, a night and day. You could blindfold me and I would know when I had an Alfie stick in my hand. That's just awesome. stunning when all the uh, all the markings in there and everything else was just you know just a kind of you know the hair on the back of my neck stood up as well as my heart warming at the same time it was just it was just weird but uh yeah that was a 2006 stick but uh it was great to uh you know we uh, we talked for quite a while yesterday and uh this morning before I left Albany I must talk with uh, with Brent for about a, another hour hour and a half this morning over breakfast and uh uh, just talking about old school lacrosse and um, different programs that started and uh, the waybacks and things like that, the 90s, 2000s, and that era. It was just amazing just to, to talk about all that and hear things firsthand, 
and how some things went, as well as, uh, you know, jibbering back and forth about things that are going on now, sixes and other things, and, you know, coming to common ground on some ideas and other things. And, you know, I even came up with an idea of, you know, one for maybe Joanne Storkin, if she's listening. Um, the, the idea of Field of Dreams came to my mind. And, uh, you know, we're talking about Shirley's Joe and Cooperstown and all the rest of that. And I think that there would be a really good movie if we could find a Field of Dreams and do it with lacrosse. I think that would be an absolute uh, stunner of a movie. And um, I think it would be able to get a lot of mainstream to watch that as well and be able to put the history in, and in a, in a light, light way that it would uh, actually gain more present time viewership. So if you're listening, Joanne, that's my pitch. Let's see what we can do because there's so many players that are around still and so many stories that can be told. And I think it would be more interesting than a baseball movie, honestly. But uh, hey, Definitely. that's uh, that's it. And Eduardo is with us, St. Augustine, Florida. Oh, hey. no. oh, he's 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 come to gloat. <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, we'll get into that. Yeah. We're going to hold off on that for the time being. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a good day. We've had a good day. And yes, of course, Guido, thanks for being with us. And yes. The drive is just numbing. The only thing that was really great was the weather was was good both days. So, you know, although the leaves aren't on the trees yet, the scenery was still the scenery. So it did give me a, a chance to see uh, a lot of um, small town America. And uh, I rather enjoyed the drive for a good chunk of it. And then after a while, it just got long. And then, of course, I got into Toronto and then it just got silly. Yeah. Even Sunday afternoon, silly. But uh yeah, it is what it is. Um, just before we get rolling, guys, just for the network, just to remember, remember all the shows are streamed live across Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and also Twitch. And you catch all the action on EOPSports.com. Remember to hit the subscribe, follow, and like buttons. Always share. Tell everybody about us, please. Enjoy all of our affiliates. Steel Steps is going nuts this weekend with uh, WrestleMania stuff. We've got one of our guys from EOP that has actually got media credentials over in Lincoln Field and is doing an awful lot of work, and he has been really busy all week and doing some great stuff, cranking out some great reports. Um, I don't think we'll see Pat. I'm pretty sure that uh, he is busy with all that, but uh, the invitation has been laid to him if he can come in for Wings Nest today. Uh, if not, we totally understand that uh, WrestleMania is going on as we speak, and, uh, man, is it ever nutty over at uh, Lincoln Field and all of Philadelphia with everything. But it looks great. Everything I've watched so far has been top notch. You can tell it's the new era, the Paul Levesque era. Anyways, if you missed a show, no worries. You can grab all the podcasts and all the major podcasting companies, which include iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Amazon, Spotify, and so much more. You can also catch all the shows on the EOP YouTube page at EOP Sports. Or if you're looking for our stuff in particular, and there's a lot more stuff up there already. Um, you can catch it on the All Across All the Time YouTube page in which you can catch interviews, press conferences, a lot of retro games, our entire library, as well as fights and older interviews. Um, lots of stuff still to come in there. So please tell your friends, tell your family, tell everybody to please subscribe there. And uh, we can use that as another tool for everything. Remember, you can stay up to date with all sports by visiting eopsports.com with great articles from our huge staff of contributors. While you're there, please subscribe to our newsletter. Well, we um, we have one uh, bit of thing to, that's upcoming, and that is the third annual uh, McDougal uh, Memorial, and that is over at the Rock Athletic Center on July 6th. Uh, you have a junior game at 3 p.m., junior A, uh, a celebrity game at 6 p.m., always a lot of great names there. Uh, yesteryear, this year, tomorrow year every year and um, some guys uh, from the NHL as well like to show up there and do some playing so it is a great time and inexpensive there is also a silent auction that runs 4 till 10 p.m lots of great stuff I picked up a bunch of great stuff over the last few years especially last year there's a beer garden keep yourself busy and live music so I think 10 bucks is the cost uh, you want to get over there if you're anywhere in the area and um, uh, who's who 
will be there. I uh, can definitely tell you I will be there. The uh, Bats Invitational we've been pumping out for the last month or so. Well, it went off on Saturday. The uh, Bats won 25-7 to over the Laxney uh, Invitational champions. And uh, Mike Cooper, friend of the show and the uh, owner and founder of the Rochester Bats, number 26 there in your picture, he had a couple of goals, but more importantly, as uh, to Mike's character, he also had a scrap. <laughs> a little good-hearted thing there, but, uh, you know, got to keep it real, y'all. Got to keep it real. It'd be a bad invitational without one, right? Yeah, well, of course, exactly. man. Of course. <laughs> otherwise, it looks staged. <laughs> it's, ballet, isn't it? it's lacrosse, man. You want flag football? We've got a field outside. Yeah. <laughs> Can't take the, uh, can't take the, uh, the, the, uh, um, shall we say the contact out of lacrosse, man. <laughs> Not a soft game. Anyways, uh, happy birthday to the Gate brothers who had their birthday the other day. They are now 57. Young, young, I will say. Nobody be squinting. I'll be 57 this year. Young. <laughs> um, news that I actually broke on the other show. On Thursday, um, totally by accident, but it happened. Uh, Reed Reinhold was my guest, and he had let it uh, be known on the show before anybody had uh, publicized it that The Rock had signed him uh, for the end of the season. It was actually a day before, because Friday was a deadline, to sign up free agents that could be still available for playoffs. So, big news there. Um, he was a huge part of... Uh, some of the teams that uh, were really successful. And uh, his role here will be to fill in for um, any of the guys that uh, A, need a rest, or B, get hurt. And uh, that's great insurance to have uh, coming off the bench. Fantastic player. Speaking of coming back, Challen Rogers, he's back. Missed six games uh, with a shoulder injury, and uh, he is back. Looked very good yesterday. We'll get into that little more when we get into the uh, recaps. Uh, the weekly Nick Rose milestones. Uh, last week we skipped it because he didn't play. But uh, with his victory yesterday, passes Bob Watson for the most career wins in Toronto Rock history with 106. Um, interesting enough, I was telling Sean off air, Nick Rose had a goalie goal at the end of uh, yesterday's uh, game. Um, it's, on the, uh, it's in the highlights, so we'll get to see it. But um, interestingly enough, I have been at every one of his goals. The two in Toronto against Buffalo. <laughs> I was at the one in Rochester when he scored. And I was, of course, yesterday at Albany's game uh, when he scored again. So just a little FYI. Maybe uh, get me some first class. <laughs> Nick, Nick Rose can be a 50 goal. Yeah, hey, I'll break the yeah. record, right? Next one breaks the record. That's it, you know. So. Uh, anything's possible. Speaking of records, Jeff Teat. He was the first to 50 goals in the NLL this year. Second time in his career to reach that milestone in his third season. Uh, pretty wild. Yeah. Remember the riptide go as Jeff Teat goes. And talking about success stories, the Georgia Swarm clinched yesterday with their victory. So they are in the playoffs. All right. Without further ado, why don't we uh, – Get this over with, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> it looks so promising, man. I went 4-0 and on Friday. And then a 2-2 two and two day or whatever or something like that. 2-3 and three day. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways, we have a new leader. Eduardo is our new leader at 74 and 46. Some uh, heavy-duty uh, numbers there. Uh, Sean and Pat are tied in second at 73 and 47. I am still on their heels at 71 and 49. And Mike is starting to fall further back. But uh, I see what Mike's doing. He has to make things happen, so he has to go against the grain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, if he gets a week of upsets, he goes 8 0. Oh, uh, we're all screwed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, every one of us will go 0 and 8. Highly yeah. unlikely. <laughs> but uh, if we look at it, you know. Six and three for Pat and myself and Sean. Eight and one for Eduardo. Just absolutely amazing picking. And Mike yeah. at four and five because he's trying to make things happen. 
Not that he can't pick it up. <laughs> uh huh. Thanks, Travis. Good to have you around. <laughs> they actually uh, are doing quite well with attendance this year. Uh, they have turned a corner. Yeah, missing a few zeros on that number. Yeah, absolutely. One way was going to was that the Vancouver game, Eduardo? <laughs> or the Toronto game? <laughs> Just got lucky. <laughs> Hey. And of course, Brian is with us. Um, we hope you're doing well, Brian. Um, the wings didn't do so well, but uh, we hope you're able to, you know, keep a chin up. <laughs> Mind you, by now, I guess everybody in Philadelphia is getting used to these uh, uh, end of fourth quarter collapses. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, just some weird, weird things. I expected that team just to come out guns a blazing after Paul Day's press conference last week. Your thoughts. And, uh, yeah. They played about 38 minutes today. And of those 38 minutes, none of them were the last six. You know, maybe if they would have played 42 minutes, they could have come away with the victory in this one. It just, they, they, uh, they pull up the, uh, they pull the reins uh, just a little bit early seems on this, on these games. And uh, that's when weird things happen. Anyways, we'll come back to that. Um, I want to start this week since we're be, be doing majority of uh, NLL things uh, this week. Um, we'll start with the uh, Buffalo, Colorado game. Another nail biter, guys. Dane Smith scores five. Uh, Burn adds a Hattie as the Bandits uh, win NLL Finals rematch. Um, why don't we get a, a look at the um, the highlights? Here and uh, then we'll get to talking. Gillis was able to get over center and his, his troops were on the floor. And on, smart play by Buffalo to, to double that right away. There goes Dane Smith and he does that right away. Gets a goal. He was unstoppable a week ago. Looks like he brought that same energy to Colorado. And that, that's with Dylan Kinnear. He's just an wrestling match and a shot. He ended up setting a screen. Short. And a goal for Colorado. Colorado boxed up. And there's a sneak by that, I believe, was Byrne who took the late hit. And it gets by Dylan Ward. And we have a tie game. It's to Cloutier. Now he tried to throw it to Cloutier. He was knocked down. So Colorado tops in the league on the penalty kill. Dane Smith doesn't care. There's a second in a row on the power play. For Buffalo, they take back the lead 5-4 with that Dane Smith goal, his second of the night. Trying to go to work. That's McLaughlin with it. Goes over to Robinson. Robinson will feed Kelly. He fires and scores. Game is tied before we go to the half, depending on the last two seconds. Williams with it, low corner. Now to Robinson again. Kinnear with the pick. Creates the lane. They go back door. That's a goal. Oh, Eli McLaughlin was hanging out. At that X position, if it was field, and everybody clearing space for his teammates. Now the ball finds him again. He gets to the middle, dumps it off to Buchanan, and it's a goal. Dylan Ward trying to look as big as possible. Seconds left to go in that penalty. Eight on the clock. No, oh, there's a pass right to the middle. Nancy Coke's free and scores. Score goal right there. That was. That was really impressive. Colorado still the power play. There's another power play goal from Connor, from Connor Robinson. Career goal number 100 for Connor. Brings him one goal closer to Buffalo. 9-8 our score. It's for the Mammoth. So Jordan's going to go ahead and pull it out. Now coming right down the middle. Zed, he scores. Zed Williams fresh off the bench with that hop shot you talked about. They go up high to Dane Smith. Dane Smith just bowling through the Mammoth defense and scores. I didn't see who tried to check him. Was that Robert Hope? But Dane Smith was just like a freight train. That was Owen Downs, the young kid. Well, wasn't uh, the token Anna Coke pass to Kyle Buchanan just something else? That was just a thing of beauty, wasn't it? Yeah. Let alone his goal just after that. It was just but this game was back and forth the entire way. When I say a nail biter, I mean it was really strange half in the first half, which saw both teams get on runs. 
and then went over 15 minutes without scoring. And then it got noticeably chippier in the second, in the third quarter. Uh, Buffalo jumping out to a couple of gold lead. Of course, Dane Smith and uh, Josh Byrne both having great nights. Connor Kelly and Zed Williams came to life in the fourth, aided by Buffalo's undisciplined play and taking a bunch of penalties. Uh, but Byrne and Smith ignited and scored back-to-back for the 13-11 win. Back-to-back-to-back, actually, if you include the uh, empty netter at the end. Just um, a wild game, eh, guys? Yeah, but I guess, you know, good teams find ways to win. <laughs> I guess that's, you know, that's what Buffalo did right at the end there, right, to pull away. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, do we think that um, Buffalo has uh, kind of found their uh, their thing now? Um, some people are thinking that uh, uh, the league uh, should be uh, more weary of them. I'm not so sure. I, I'm, I'm thinking that if you can uh, find a way to shut down uh, Smith or Byrne, or by some way both, uh, or disrupt it a little bit, um, that they are uh, – um, that team is not going to be doing all that much. Am I am I wrong? Uh, I, I wouldn't say you're. I wouldn't say you're completely wrong. I, I don't think they're. I don't think they're quite where they were at this point last season, where where mm-hmm. they were just red hot and unstoppable. They 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 right. Don't yeah. they don't quite project that aura of invincibility. <laughs> Like they did la- at the end of last year, but you know they're they're still the champs and they're still a dangerous team. So, uh, right, you yeah, know, right. And, um, and, 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 right. And I was gonna, yeah. Well, so, certainly. I mean, you saw that. <laughs> you saw that during the stretch of games where he was on injured reserve. <laughs> well, and, yeah. and you saw, you saw him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's the reason they're not, you know, 12 and 5 right now or 12 and 4. So, yeah. Instead of, yeah. instead of 9 and 7. So, yeah. Yeah, I was going to disagree with you, Mike. Um, I don't know exactly about shutting down uh, Smith and Burns. They still have, like, the Natacoke, uh, Kluche. You still have some backup scoring there, but, um, Again, yeah, I agree. They don't look like the same team they were. And Vince has looked somewhat human <laughs> this season. Because let's face it, they, the Burn and Smith uh, had a, I think accounted for something like 35 points in the last two games. Two or three games. Just something, some absolutely obscene yeah. uh, number between the two of them. That's a lot of points that the, uh, the rest of the team is not – Scoring and both wins. If you're able to cut cut down one of them, um, I think you're also going to be able to hamper the other one. And uh, these games aren't blowouts. If you're knocking them down by even two or three, um, that's a loss to Colorado. Just uh, putting that out there. So, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's all. You know, I don't think the Connor Farrell thing is, is going as well as they uh, they thought it might be. Um, yes, he had a decent day here, but as soon as he faces, say, uh, I don't know, T.D. Erlen, Trevor Baptiste, these are the ones he's going to face in the playoffs. Well, that's a good point, Gary, because he, he had an okay day. It was like he was 16 of 28, so that's yeah, kind of in the 50-50 mark. Like, it wasn't... He wasn't dominating by any means. And he's also not going against one of the top face-off guys in the league. No. So what happens when that happens? Those numbers dip. Just like Colorado has had trouble all year with their defense, with their offense. And um, they were still able to do both in this game. And this is a team that's supposedly mailing it in since they made all those trades. Yeah, I mean, I well, I think they've kind of shown shown that they're not. I mean, it's it's a maybe a different story now after after this game, where uh, where their playoff hopes are are all but 
uh, vanish. Gave away two perennial all stars, yeah. Dawson and Wardell. And um, you're doing better. How does that work? I mean, the head scratcher. My uh, my yeah. Opinion. It, it 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 is, but you know, Daw- I mean, Dawson's near the end of his career, so you know, I I I don't know that there was a guarantee, maybe that he'd be coming back next year. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. I, th- I think you need two hands to count the number of times Wardle was, you know, drafted by another team during expansion only to be traded back. <laughs> it's also that Dawson works in Brampton as a fireman. And uh, it's a heck of a lot easier to get to Buffalo. So it might have been, um, if we're not doing anything, do you think that maybe you can get me a little closer to home? Yeah. Sure. Uh, to me, sure. to me, to me, the Wardle trade was more the head scratcher than Dawson. Dawson kind of made sense, like you said, from Burlington near the end of his career. It was the Wardle one that's more of a head scratcher. If you're selling, then fine, then fine. You're selling him off. That's fair. But yeah, to trade him off and do better, uh, that that's a head scratcher. So other than it uh, frees up a a spot for somebody else, uh, there's two two uh, spots in the lineup that were now available. Where, you know, maybe better chemistry. I don't know. I don't know. I just, and, I just, and, I can't put my finger on it. Yeah. Now their first round pick belongs to Philly. Do they? Do they have someone else's first round pick from a different transaction? I don't think so. And I would have to look that up on. Uh, have to look it up. Let's it up. So something to food for thought. All right, let's uh, let's move over. I want to move over to the. Uh, we're talking about Wardle. Uh, let's move over to the San Diego Panther City game. And um, well, Stott scores four to set franchise record for goals in the season. Crawford nets a hattie. Um, San Diego finds it in the uh, the end of the game because uh, that was nip and tuck also, right down to the wire. And then uh, the last couple of minutes, uh, San Diego pulls it out. It's a lot closer game than that score is indicative of. Let's have a look at the highlights. Defensive side of the floor. I haven't seen any rookie nerves out of him. He's playing with confidence and I expect him to make an impact tonight. Crawford tiptoeing the crease. Nail those picks a little more aggressively and jump out to the ball carrier. Stotts on a step down, buries it. And the Seals effectively kill off the penalty as Panther City slips to one for 13 in their last three plus games. Berg feeds ahead. Seals tie the game. Patrick Schumann with his first of the year. Malcolm. To Caputo on the backside. Great feed by Malcolm as Origlieri's green light. But maybe that one should have been a yellow. Berg stings the high corner. Shot clock winding down. And kind of give a palms up like, hey, that's kind of my my role right there. And Crawford, oh. just like he drew it up. The old bobble to yourself. in the issue. Goodwin this time hums it wide. And the Seals can run this time. Baptiste head down, pushing the tempo. And it's Bradley who beats Tamud. Bluffs, Berg back pedals. Berg back to Stotts with space. And he buries another one. A first half hat trick is Trey Leclerc. Crawford to Malcolm, final seconds. Caputo beats the buzzer. Oh man. Lusky about getting out and just getting set versus coming out as we see a penalty here. Wesley Berg, one fake, two fake, red fake, blue fake. <laughs> Sheridan pulled them within one a couple of minutes ago. Now Crawford with space. Crawford scores again, and we're tied at seven. Has those strong relationships with the rest of the players and coaching staff. It's definitely nice having him back here in the building, guys. Baptiste for the first time this year, and what a moment to put San Diego up a goal. Panther City's defense covers possession. 
Now Goodwin buries up high. Panther City gets one in transition to tie it at eight. McClaire rolling to the net, can't handle the pass. Wardle, shot clock running out, and Chris Wardle with his first is a seal. But outside and up off the boards. No reset of the shot clock. Knox has it. Donville to Knox. Step down. Knox ties the game. Philadelphia. And then have games each of the final two weeks. Malcolm, first of the night, gives Panther City the lead. Chris knocks the ball loose. Under five minutes left. Stotts ties it at 10. Four for Austin Stotts. Power play went four for five a couple weeks ago. They can take the lead with a goal. Stotts back to Berg. The hat trick goal gives it back to San Diego. City. Malcolm Thompson knocks. And a mistake by Panther City as Dolby out of the box. Dolby to the net, and he buries it! And there you have it, guys. Um, what they didn't odd. show was when it was 10-9 uh, for Panther City. Um, they had a great opportunity. Uh, passed over to Crawford, who was all alone at the side of the net, and Arigliari just made a beautiful save. Just was able to step to his right and get his shoulder there. And uh, otherwise, this could have been a whole different ball game, because right yeah. away after that, Stott scored on the other end. Yeah, that that was definitely the turning point. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of things I want to add before we get into this. Uh, you mentioned uh, Reed Reinhold signing right near the deadline. Um, Panther City also yeah. had a signing, uh, John Lintz. Uh He didn't play this game, but he did play today against uh, against Philly, and then. Um, I, I quickly looked at uh, at swarming up for that uh, that info. Colorado does mm -hmm. not have a first round pick. Um, they have several they trade. Did. They have several trade partners who have several first round picks. Um, Georgia has three first round picks. Buffalo has three first round picks, and Toronto has two. And we all know. <laughs> okay, we all know about Jamie pick. Dalek's allergy yeah. to uh, to first round picks. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah, funny how that is. <laughs> so, so Colorado does have a few trade partners, and uh, a couple other teams have some trade partners too. Their potential is uh, obviously there's there's a number of teams that that do not have a first round pick this year. So. Yeah, I agree. Panther, Panther City is yeah. good. I don't know about great, but they're good. And San Diego is relentless. Yeah, and I mean, we're, hey, we've been talking. We're, we're talking about Buffalo finding ways to win. I mean, uh, I, I, well, San Diego, yeah, we, we, we can't. Yeah, we we can't not talk about San Diego continuously finding ways to win. I mean, you know, they're they're this time of year it was Trevor Baptiste who got his first two goals of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah at the right and, time. I mean, they, and and they're still, you know, it's it's probably unlikely, uh, given that they don't hold the tie break. But right now, technically, they still can clinch the number one seed. They'd have to win out and have Toronto lose out, but it, it's still a possibility. So, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, a little more uh, around the uh, lineup for scoring for San Diego. Uh, which is uh, something we've been talking about week in, week out, <clears throat> that for a team this high-powered, uh, it doesn't seem like they've all been um, at the same time being on the same page. Fire, game like yeah. this yeah. where you've got guys like Chris Wardle getting his first goal, uh, Westberg doing his thing, Dolby with a beauty, um, Stotts with four. Um, this is a trailer, Claire. This is one of those games where – Everybody contributed. Still defensive breakdowns, though. Interesting, too. No Dixon in the lineup, too. With that. Right. Again. Yeah. yeah. How many games is that now? That's He's got to be three or four now that, that he's been yeah. out of yeah. the lineup. So, you know, hopefully this is uh, just a – I hate to use – I hate to make us sound like the NBA here about the load management kind of thing. Hopefully right. it's not uh, – one of the yeah. reasons I think they got Chris Wardle was to relieve 
some of the guys who are a little bit more beaten up down the stretch. You know, guys like Stotts, guys like Dixon. So it's it's a possibility that Wardle's in because Dixon's out. Because somebody's got to come out yeah. and let him rest. And then if he's in full um, uh, Dixon mode come playoffs, that brings a whole new realm of hurt to that oh, yeah. sealed offense. Oh, yeah. So timing is everything. Just like Challen Rogers coming back for the Rock uh, a couple of games before the end of the season to get his rust off and full tail boogie come playoffs. Right. So, you know, timing is everything. But uh, Seals, uh, they win again and put the pressure squarely on Toronto to win this week to keep keep up. You were going to say something, Mike? No, no, just, just, <laughs> I had made my previous point about, uh, Mm-hmm. About San Diego still having a chance. I mean, I guess if Toronto, absolutely, if Toronto, if, yeah, if, Toronto, if, Toronto, if Toronto wins, they'll they'll pretty much clinch home home field throughout. So, yeah, yeah, and they have Rochester yeah. uh, on Saturday at home. Um, you know, if we're looking at trends, you know, that doesn't look so good for Rochester. But uh, I've seen stranger things happen. And I saw some stranger things happen this week. Which brings me to Saskatchewan and Calgary 1. Uh, it's a battle of the bad turfs, guys. But I just <laughs> we'll start off with the blue turf. Uh, that would be Del Bianco shines with 52 saves. And highlight real assist as Roughnecks take battle of the prairies. Um, why don't we have a look at uh, uh, how this went down and... Um, We'll come back to it. Curtis, Ontario. The pace back to Cook. King trying to set a screen on Cook. Iso. On Bobby Kidd, the third inside. All alone, Walter. On his wrong side, and Del Bianco quickly up ahead. Simpson shot. Cook saving a beauty from Chiliano. Back in the net. Just been snake bit all season long. He's got the loose balls. He's got the cause turnovers. Backdoor cut the goal. King beats Dixon. Prairie boys in the lineup. Jack Mann shot save Del Bianco. Mann again with a glorious opportunity. Up ahead, Matsuoka scores as he takes a hit. Gruden hasn't had a ton of good looks yet. No matter time for it, he heats up. Triolo finally, just as Salama gets out of the box. 429 fans at night. Electric atmosphere here at the Saddle Hill. Pace to Dixon. Shot scores! A little stutter step got Adam J on his heel. Again, flying down the floor. Take away the transition opportunity. Up on Zach Mann. So a little indecisive on how to play that. Outside rip and a goal. That's a great start for the Saskatchewan Rug. It's a pick there from Pace. It's Tanner Cook. Cook shot wide. Rebound scores! Great job by Jesse King to roll to the middle. Side, watched there by Enju. Gets a pick from Dixon, gives it off to Taylor. Taylor spins underneath, dies, shoots, scores! Two goals, quick succession. Pace the Cook. Ten on the shot clock for Calvin. Into Holger! Oh my goodness! Rock it, save it! Of the sweet mitts on number 91. Draws penalties, gets guys open. And nice to see him get a goal that draw, drop the jaws right out of the park. Pace! Speed. Cook to King. Up top. Josh Kern scored! Pulled it short side on Shiliano. His motion stop. He's here. Dirty me finally! Thanks, one hole. Church is first on the power play. Ten on the shot clock. Dodge. Inside, Church couldn't find it. Inside, but Walter scores! Back to back! There's still life in the rush. Dixon. Cook, one on one with Keegan Bell. Two big bodies. Inside, flip doesn't connect. But it falls right to Dixon! He's got the hat trick. And it stops the run of the rush. 
Cook. Cornwall heads off. Eight man is Taylor. Five on the shot clock. King, shot around the screen, and he scores! Huge goal from the captain. All righty. Uh, might I say that I like the uh, Calgary uniform uh, just because it's not that colorless old rush colors. Yeah. Uh, it actually has some some color to it. God, I wish they could go back to the red. Uh, yeah. I'm right with but, you on that uh, one. Yeah. Um, you can't get down 4 nothing and not score until almost the halfway point of the second quarter and have good things happen to you. Well, so, but on the other hand, at the end of the game, they had 62 shots and they weren't. There were some good looks. Uh, Christian Del Bianco. Can you imagine if actually had a couple of goals at the beginning? That's a win. Christian Del Bianco shut the door. <laughs> Simple enough. And you could see the frustration in that offense. And that's what Christian Del Bianco does. He frustrates offenses. Um, Saskatchewan dominated almost every single statistical category face offs. Shots, everything but goals. I, I, I don't know how you can fault. Like, what more could the rush have done? <laughs> like I say, they got to get off to a better start. And uh, uh, when we uh, play the second game and play the, play the press conference, that's uh, that point comes up. Yeah, is just better starts to the game because if you're playing uphill. And again, I bring it into the playoffs. You know, we're not talking about a middle of the road team because where Saskatchewan will get in if they get in, they're playing Toronto or San Diego. Um, you get down four or five nothing to those teams with those defenses, and um, it, it ain't going to be an easy trip. Yeah. You know, and I don't think you're going to get 60 or 70 shots against those teams. But, uh, you know, it's. Uh, it's a game where I think um, even though they had such a slow start, was winnable. Um, oh. They did an awful lot. And they were able to negate a lot of the Calgary transition. You know, unfortunately, when they weren't able to stop it, uh, it bit them. Yeah. No, like I completely agree with that. Um, again, like I just, I don't know what to say. I think the effort was there. It's just... Well, I'm not saying they didn't they, have an they ran. They ran into a hot goalie, right? And mm -hmm. That's going to happen, well, especially yeah, against Calgary. What happens if they play Buffalo and they run into a hot Vince? Yeah. Well, I mean, that can happen to any team, right? They just <laughs> turn, turn, turn it down and go, well, it wasn't our year. Yeah. <laughs> you have to find ways to do it. And uh, I don't know. Sometimes it comes into running through the crease a few times just to get the message across. Yeah. Get them sidetracked. You don't have to make contact. Just have to get them sidetracked enough that they're not a hundred percent focused. Well, and I think that's again going back to your point about getting started early. That's what we see with Del Bianco. If you can get to him early, yeah, it's good to have him here, right? That's yeah. kind of his Achilles' heel. If you can get to him early, he, he kind of downfalls from there. Which it's the same thing with Warren Hill. Yeah, uh, when you're talking about that, when's the next full gamer? If you go to the NLL uh, page on Facebook, uh, most of this weekend's full games are there, Matt. So you can catch almost all of them off of the NLL Facebook page. Sketch one needed a. Like they did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the two Calgary Sask games were, were the best yeah. of the weekend. I agree, especially the second one when I rewatched that. Um, this morning it was like wow, wow. So, yeah, all right, and uh, that one's in the books. We did have um, I don't know if you call it an upset. It's hard to call it a, a team that's won four to five <clears throat> uh, and win another one, uh, an upset. But Halifax went into Vancouver on uh, on Friday, and uh, well, even though Halifax had to lead for a while. Uh, ball continues toward pace with five goals. Warriors win their fourth straight to stay alive for the playoffs. 15-13 over Halifax. That is deadly for Halifax. And they're uh, spiraling out of the uh, the top group. Um, 
now they go into the middle section and it's uh, uh, hold on and uh, hopefully you have the tie break at this way or another way because uh, they're starting to go into that Buffalo zone in my eyes and uh, don't have the tie break with this one and don't have the tie break with that one and hope to finish ahead of this one and maybe they with a bit of luck they can be ahead of that one I think Mike yeah yeah the, those those really are are the two teams that are kind of in a playoff spot now but but Almost seem to be, them, but yeah, yeah, seem to be yeah. in the most danger. You know, uh, <laughs> we we talked about it off air, and and obviously one of the uh, one of those results uh, this week did didn't happen, but uh, but there's still probably about six or seven teams right now that can all end up at nine and nine, which would make <laughs> <laughs> a real mess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would be that would be about six or seven teams looking for about three playoff spots, three four playoff spots. So, yeah, Matt, I uh, I had my hands on a Syracuse match jersey as well, and it was going to cost me a couple of bucks, and uh, I still may I still may pull that one off, but uh, uh, I have to go see in the uh, in the storage chests what I have as trade bait to try and knock it down a bit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, that is a, a really a great one. The Syracuse smash one. Yeah. But uh, okay, why don't we have a look at the uh, the highlights of the uh, Halifax Vancouver game and then we'll get back to uh, what's going on. Back the other way, reverse transition. Peterson cross crease scores. Oh, what a setup from Peterson. There's Keegan Ball into the middle. Charlotte Beatty's rim shoots and a weak one. Oh, it's a pass down to kill a rebound. Chance Markel scores. With it's actually four away now after that one, as he's looking to become the fifth player to reach 1,800. Oh, another goal here for Halifax, this time from behind the rack once again. Ball bounces to Martell with 14 on the shot clock. Penalty call coming here to Terrafinko. Double team coming to Martell, scores! Short side. Looking to improve it. Charlotte Beatty's hit the shot. Rebound scores! Oh, Charlotte Beatty's robbed by the butt end of Hill, but ricocheted right to Crowley on the tap back. Nice and Bell. Lady just getting back to the bench now. There's Keegan Ball one more time. He's got the hot stick. Scores! That's what I'm talking about. 45 with two in a row. And Vancouver within one. These guys on this Vancouver team that the younger guys can watch and learn from. He knows how to get it done in this league. He's been doing it a long, long time. Here's Hasek, and a rebound scores! Oh, Halifax right back the other way. The atmosphere inside. Vancouver tonight is ball again down the middle. How did he hang on to that? Scores! Oh, clip it for Keegan Ball! And then to take away that opportunity from Shanks to take advantage. Charlotte Beatty's into the middle, all sorts of rims, scores! And Vancouver is in the lead for the first time tonight. Penalty of the game. Ganesh, a low drive quickly. Walsh, a quick outlet here for Bowering. Can he run onto this one? He can. Feed in front, ball short-handed! Scores! Wasn't that a thing of beauty? Yeah. That, oh, yeah. <laughs> that short-handed goal was just a thing of beauty. That flip pass was gorgeous. Now, I'm sure that you guys are seeing the same thing I'm seeing, is that this Vancouver team is playing with a ton of confidence. You take a look at Ball's shot, yeah. and he's convinced he can score from anywhere. You took a look, take a look at Ryan Martell and the way he's uh, crashing the net and diving. This is stuff you didn't see in game one, two, three, four, five of the season when things weren't going so great. This team is full of confidence. You look at even Walsh in net. He gives up a goal. You don't see any slumping. He just scoops it out and we're back to it. That Aaron Bold idea of short-term memory and get back to it is clicking on now. 
Like that's yeah. so sorry, Gary. That's just the point I was going to make. Uh, that's actually a coaching decision I loved that they made. Is even though they were down, you know, second third quarter, they kept Walsh in, let him work it out. Yep. Yep. Let the young uh, work it out, and that's exactly what he did. Exactly, and you know, they, obviously they figured out that he is their future, and he's got to find ways to, you know, find the inner uh, confidence, not just having somebody pump smoke into him, but find that inner confidence that, that yeah, I belong here. Yeah, yeah, it's going to go in. I'm not going to pitch a shutout. And just shake it off, etch a sketch, boom, we start over. And, yeah, I see it more and more week in, week out, that this is, that's what he's become. And in the cases when he doesn't, that's when you have an Aaron Bold step in and, uh, you know, there it is. Yeah. So, Mike, what's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, obviously, <laughs> obviously Halifax is, is reeling and, and Vancouver's full of confidence, uh, you know, uh, and the, their, their last two games, I mean, it's not out of the, it's not out of the realm of possibility for, for, for them to finish, finish the season at 500. Uh, you know, whether that's enough to get them a playoff spot, I don't know, but they're hosting New York next week. Um, the finale, a little tougher, Week 21 is at San Diego. Uh, it's their only meeting, but, you know, they, despite their record against San Diego, they've always played the Seals tough the last few and years. And this time so, around, they're a tougher team to play they, against. They're, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're very much a different team. So that, that you know, uh, San Diego, in, automatic San Diego win is not written in stone, I don't think, in this case. Plus, by that last week, if Toronto has a couple of wins, uh, San Diego might be playing for nothing. Yeah. Right? If Toronto's got yeah. a couple of wins, not playing for first place, they've already clinched home for uh, for the rest of their uh, their things, um, then it's, uh, you know, maybe pull the shoots on a couple of guys and get them some rest. Yeah, and they, and they can't fall. I, uh, at this point, they can't fall any farther than – second seed San Diego. So it was funny because Gary mentioning that that's kind of my hopes with Saskatchewan is they have San Diego and Toronto were really playing for nothing. So they, oh well, yeah, but Toronto's still playing for that. I mean, they, they, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, but that's come last they, week. They may not be <laughs> true. 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 Very true. 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 All it's going to take is one win. So, so, you know, as long as, uh, as long as SAS can take care of business, but you know, Unfortunately for them, it's against. I mean, I know it's a tough road to call. No. Like, that's all I hope I got right. <laughs> <laughs> we all need dreams, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, no. So, uh, uh, excuse me. I was going to say, unfor unfor unfortunately, when when you're when we're looking at all these seven and nine teams and what they have left, uh, Saskatchewan probably has the toughest, the toughest slate. Yeah. despite Both games being at home. So. Right. Right. All right, let's move on. Uh, we move into the Saturday games, and the game that I was at uh, is, uh, of course, Toronto in Albany at the MVP Arena. Nick Rose makes 47 saves and scores a goal as Rock improves to the league best 13-3 and record. Um, I thought that um, that Albany looked real good in the, uh, in the first, and then all of a sudden the roof came crashing in in the second when Toronto scored. Uh, six times to before uh, Albany got a goal. So a 2-1 lead uh, became a 7-3 deficit at the half. And uh, then, of course, uh, the defenses showed what they could do on both sides. And it became a track meet of, of epic proportions and a lot of defensive work. And the Toronto defense, man, they just reckless abandoned, man. They throw themselves in front of shots they hit tap sticks. They do all kinds of things to change directions to make it a little bit easier for Nick Rose. And when Nick has to make the save, my God, Nick is looking better than ever. There is a real problem if he doesn't win goaltender of the year this year. Unless the roof falls in in the next two weeks, there is something wrong with his system if he doesn't win it this time around. Though I was a proponent for the last two. 
and his numbers backed it up. So let's see. Let's look at the highlights here, and then we'll get back talking about the game. Bid on the Albany defense, guarded by Jokum. And for Jamison to come home with that goaltender of the year, we talked to Matt Sawyer. Is there's Rogers? Welcome back to the lineup. And what we saw a couple weeks ago is Simmons wide and scores. Albany's going to need some transition when Toronto's not set on the. You can draw that same connection between some of the best goalies in the league that Rose has been facing. And what a shot, Brendan. Wow. Holy cow, Chris Bushy. That was a laser beam that zoomed across the middle of the floor. B lacrosse with the Oakville Rock. And Coach Sawyer has watched him grow into a young pro. And on the move again, this time, Mark Matthews came around the screen and punched it in short side. Terrell soared into the stands. A reset for Toronto since there was contact with Albany. Rogers receives a pair of screens. Skip pass from up top to Schreiber. My goodness, Schreiber found the perfect pocket to fire. Just Kurtz is the first man out the door. His rip on the belly of Rose. Desnu in transition delivers. Eighth, the new 30 second shot clock for the Rock. Skip pass, Bushi shovels it in. Oh, Bushi, he got rid of that so quickly. Schreiber. Defended tightly by Leo Sturz. Finds a cutter, and Lintner scores. Seventh goal scorer for Toronto. Lintner cashes in with his 15th play. As we approach a minute left in the third, Albany with the ball in the retro jerseys. The Albany attack unis going back to the early 2000s. Kurtz, nice feed to Firth on the door. Couldn't put it home. He's the lone two-goal scorer. That's proof that Toronto this year more than other years, and they score. Matthews, they know how to finish games. Yeah, they were running Guess That Movie, so maybe you could catch <laughs> one of the offensive players going, I know who was in the Incredibles. Maybe a shorthanded bid coming here. Watkinson, happy birthday. And he wants the crowd to engage. By Tom Shriver, 10 seconds. Rose the save, airs it out, bouncing. Bouncing, Rose scores a goalie goal to cap it for Toronto. And like I mentioned, uh, I've been there for all four of Rose's goals. <laughs> um, pretty much the same MO on all of them. Uh, it's funny because when they first picked up Rose, I remember talking with Terry Sanderson and uh, uh, they, he had mentioned – um, of course, Rose's days uh, playing for Orangeville, uh, how he could thread his passes through the eye of a needle, how his accuracy. Well, we're seeing all this now. Um, it's funny, uh, um, Eduardo had a comment. Um, if Nick doesn't win, people will riot. Even people in Toronto won't riot. <laughs> They're still down the middle split on, on uh, whether Rose is the goalie that can win it all for them. I, uh, I, I've always liked Nick. Uh, I've always thought that Nick worked hard, and he all, his game has improved every year. And the last three years, I thought he's been sensational. And, yeah, he took a lot of abuse for the, uh, the playoffs against Buffalo last year. And um, I'm sorry. Um, yes, he was uh, um, responsible for a number of the goals, but uh, the Rock defense that was the best in the league during the year uh, should have taken chairs onto the field because they sat and watched the uh, Buffalo offense just run circles around him. And uh, as we can attest to watching Philadelphia, when your defense isn't working with you, it is very difficult, no matter what you do, uh, to win games. So um, things that I took away from this game here is um, look out. Mitch Disnew looks great in transition. Uh, he was playing – um, really chippy game, um, but not dirty. I think he only took one penalty, and that was questionable. Um, the Rock offense, Dan Craig was having a tough time on one side. Chris Bushy was uh, picking him up on the other side. Um, Corey Small, he uh, he looked great in this game. Tom Schreiber, a goal and five assists. So even when he's not uh, putting in, he covers a lot of attention. Having Challen Rogers back and the attention he garnered because they had him coming out the, the front door. 
Um, that left, well, at least two people open. Mark Matthews doing what Mark Matthews does. Two goals, two assists. But my God, he's drawing penalties. He's doing a lot more than, well, I'd seen him in the last two years in Saskatchewan. Now it's almost like the fountain of youth hit him as well. It's funny when a title uh, seems to be within grief, grief, grip, uh, what happens? Albany, um, what I saw there. Uh, I saw <clears throat> Jameson not have the best game of his career. Uh, I saw him play really well for three quarters. But the second quarter, uh, man, I don't know what happened there. Uh, I know he took one off the cage. And um, I don't know if he was the same the rest of that quarter after that. Um, I don't think he got his bell rung. I had nothing wrong with his mask. But just that initial Rally a bit. Yeah. That, uh, that would just be enough to, you know, and with a, an offense as powerful as Toronto, they only need that little in. And uh, there you go. Uh, offensively, um, <clears throat> Sam Firth looked good. Ty Kurtz as a feeder looked pretty good. Colton Watkinson with his shorthanded goal and leadership looked good. There wasn't a lot of anything else going on. I saw a lot of guys running around uh, aimlessly trying to find a spot to get a shot uh, through all the blocks the Toronto's defense had. But um, there were just that, that oomph missing. And it looks like the same thing that's happened in the last, say, four games since this losing streak has begun. Where the scoring is, you're not beating anybody if you're only scoring seven. Yeah, that seven. was exactly my question. That's my question: is where's is this offense going for Albany? Because uh, you know we saw Alex Simmons, Marshall Palace, uh, those guys just put up big, big numbers earlier this season. And now they're just kind of Simmons was good at finishing off a couple uh, last night, but uh, really, other than that, I really didn't notice him on the floor. I noticed Marshall Palace a lot on the floor. And he uh, was running around like a chicken with his head cut off, trying to find a spot to either fire a pass or fire a shot. <clears throat> but Toronto did a really good job blocking the lanes, filling in the lanes, uh, shifting, and doing everything else that needed to be done. It really was a textbook uh, performance, uh, with the exception of um, a couple of the uh, last possessions. Uh, that seemed to kill Toronto. If this game was a little bit closer, last possessions at the end of quarters, um, that's something that needs to be a, a little bit more focused on, I think, in practice. If there is that chink in the armor, you know, letting your guard down because there's only a couple of seconds left, or, you know, letting that shot, that worm burner that just kind of eludes everything into a far corner. I watched that a couple of times. So come playoff time, that could hurt. You know, when you're going into real tight games. But like the announcers had mentioned, Toronto knows how to finish games. And down the stretch, 9-7 uh, was as close as it was going to get. And uh, if you thought the defense was tight up until the um, the eight-minute mark in the fourth, the uh, news tightened entirely and completely choked off all of the Al Albany offense. And it wasn't multitudes of shots. They would get one, and it was coming right back and quickly. So getting into that track meet transitionally, uh, I don't think helped them at all. Defensively, not. They were gasping. And they were still able to hold it. Jameson looked good in the fourth. But um, they weren't able to do what they were doing in the first, say, eight or nine games of the year. Mike, what's your take on this thing? Oh, it's definitely concerning, especially since uh, especially since their two remaining games are away uh, at Panther City and at New York. So that's certainly, you know, neither of those are gimmies, and Georgia can actually leapfrog them for the number three seed with a win right. and two Albany losses. So, or or at least one more loss by Albany. So, what do you think is so different? Um, from the last four games, from the rest of the season, what is so different that they're doing or not doing that has created this this dilemma? Uh, could be, could be. I think you alluded to this earlier in the season. Uh, 
you know, when they opened the season, what, 6-0? Uh, not a lot of folks had video on a lot of the new offensive players. Right. Good point. Now teams, now Good teams have film. So now they're, now they're starting to find and exploit, you know, and, and figure out how to defend certain right. certain set plays, you know, and just understanding how, how, how the offense functions. Is it youth that are not able to make changes or adapt to some of the defense that they're seeing? Because the offense is flailing. I won't say failing, but they are flailing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's, I mean, there's a fair amount of inexperience on that team. Uh, I mean, the most experienced offensive player is well, probably Walker, right? Walker or Watkinson, both. Yeah. So, so you have Kurtz as a rookie, Simmons is a rookie, Firth has what two years? Not even. Grennan's got three. So, uh, you know, Longboat missed a season, so, you know, he's only got a couple of years. Pallas only has a couple of years. So. But is that enough for adaptability and to change what you're doing or what you have been doing to try and get a little bit more creative? Um, I would say maybe – Maybe not so much adapting, but finding finding roles or identities for the guys. Maybe right. like, hey, there's, you know, is there a leader on this offense? Like a bona fide leader versus, well, you know, we'll just, you know, anyone let me look can at handle the ball, look anyone at the can teams. score, anyone can. Because if I look over at uh, Buffalo for say, you know, Smith is the quarterback. Burn is your receiver. Occasionally the other way around, but that's your big one. And then you have Fraser, Pluche, Nana Coke as the, the outside guys to really throw wrenches in it. In Toronto, Matthews is your quarterback or Schreiber, depending on what side you want to look at. And, and then you have uh, Corey Small. You have Chris Bushy. You have Dan Craig. You have Josh Dalwick. You have Dan Lintner. Um, I, could, I could go on. <laughs> Um, there's a lot yeah, of yeah, and, all, and yeah. it almost feels like like Albany doesn't have a similar type of structure. Kind there's of, not that place. quarterback. I, I mean, it's not to say that they have no structure in place, but it, no, I'm not saying that. But I'm yeah. saying that that one guy who is that setup guy, um, or two guys, depending on what team you're looking at, who's going to quarterback it or going to do all the uh, the ins and outs and then feed it. They don't seem to have that guy, or they don't seem to have him now. Yeah. And teams are keying off that. And if your offense is running around, then nobody knows where anybody is. So then there's not set place. It's not blueprinted. So those passes are the ones that are going sailing into the corner because the guy who was supposed to be there isn't there. Or the one you thought was going there is coming this way. You know, you, you can't play free for all. All right. So let me throw this in there. Is it two part question? Mm -hmm. Is it worth trying to implement a system like that this late in the year and take into consideration one Dyson Williams coming in next year? Um, uh, let me answer the first part of that. And uh, yes, yes, to implement something, maybe not something that is um, completely etched in stone but a little bit more of a, um, we talked about that before, leader. The one who's going to quarterback, yes, that's your role, that's your role, whatever. Somebody has to take on that particular role. It's how all success is. Take a look at any of the successful teams. Take a look at any of the teams that have won in the last 10 years. They've got that guy or guys. It, just, it can't be just uh, by committee. And whatever happens, uh, we're going to try and figure it out. Because... It may work a couple of times, and it definitely will work on the on the uh, lesser ranked teams. But once you get up into the uh, the big boys play, well, you're seeing what's happening. Yeah, 
no, and a, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. As for uh, with Dyson Williams coming in, I don't think that plays anything into what is going on now, because um, Albany was looking at uh, you know you know first place for the longest point of this year, and now they're slowly making their way to the middle. You know, it's not going to happen that it'll take them all the way out, but uh, you don't want to be going into the playoffs on a six-game losing streak. That doesn't do a whole lot for young confidence. True. Well, I think based on your answers, I think the answer needs to be Ty Kurtz. I was going to say Ethan Walker, but if you're, you know, factoring in Dyson Williams coming in next year, yep. I don't think you want your yeah. – quarterback and leader to be necessarily on the same side as Williams. So I think it needs to be Kurtz. Uh, I don't think it's too late. I think, I think you're right. And I think you got the right guy, Mike. And I saw that at the beginning of the game yesterday. And then they, for some reason, got away from it. And when Kurtz was feeding, they actually looked like the system was in place, but good teams will find a way to bottle him up. And um, he really wasn't much of an issue uh, the rest of the game, but uh, it took uh, strong defense to do that. I think with a little bit more seasoning and a little bit more uh, practice of set things to do in case of that become second nature, um, as well as his talent already, I think that that is a, a damn good choice. I think that's, I think you got something there. I think that is the, the correct guy for that. And if he can feed some of the other bulls that are in there, you know, like Watkinson, and he doesn't have to do that all himself, uh, I think um, I think you got something going there. And especially when you got guys like Alex Simmons rolling. Um, like I say, the uh, the opening quarter, they didn't score a lot. They had two goals, but the the chances that they were getting were quality shots. Whereas in the second. They really didn't look like they were getting anything until near the end of the quarter. And even then, it was only one. So, you know, something changed. Uh, luckily, where I was sitting was right uh, beside the rock bench. And, uh, you know, Bruce Cod uh, had meetings continually every time his defense got off the floor. Not long ones, but everybody was turned around listening. And different things and different tries and move this and change that. And, and then, boom. and that's what great defensive coaches do. You know, in my eyes, Bruce Cott is the best defensive coach in this league. And he is adaptable to just about anything that goes on there. Do things go wrong? Yeah, of course they do. But 99 times out of a hundred, um, there's a solution and a change. And it's not usually the defense. Uh, the last year's playoff, I'll, I'll take that out of the equation where everything went wrong. But um, uh, what I've seen this year, especially when things haven't been working correctly or, you know, not seem to be on the right page. <laughs> um, there's a lot of chatter and a lot of communication back and forth and, you know, from everybody. And that's how, how it's done. And it's the second time that it stood out to me. The one was in Toronto against Halifax a couple of weeks ago when and things didn't look, things look a little disheveled. And he had a meeting at, in between quarters and that fourth quarter, they were just lights out. <clears throat> this game, continue a little, uh, little um, dickering around and changing things and uh, talking with the guys and getting the feel and his two cents and everybody being part of it. A good coach is a facilitator that works with his guys and takes input from it. And that's exactly what I was watching. And, um, you know, to me, um, that's, that's gold. And that's probably why the numbers have been that good for the last number of years. Just my, just my take on things that I was keying on was where I was sitting because I was in a prime seat for that. So, um, well, Toronto is, uh, sitting at 13 and three, um, everything is in their own hands, uh, for that to work. Uh, Guido. That's, good point. That's exactly right, too. Yeah, and yeah. when you're not scoring, that confidence just completely, completely goes out of the uh, out of the stick and the squeezing the stick and 
all the rest of it. And, you know, especially when things are changing on them. And like I say, there was a lot of running around, a lot of running around. So um, I didn't see that in the first eight games of the year. But I guess good point when the confidence is uh, running low, everybody's trying to be the hero. Everybody's trying to be, everybody's trying to do the best they can for the team, but sometimes they take on a little bit too much, especially young players. Um, in baseball, you can't hit an eight run home run. Um, you can't score a three point goal in lacrosse. So everybody has to get on the same page, even more so, I think, when things aren't working right. Patrick, what's going on? How's the wrestling going, buddy? Have they given you a belt yet? <laughs> the Gobbler Award. <laughs> I seen that uh, in the press box they had unlimited cheesesteaks. I don't know how you didn't break oh, down. Oh, that'd be oh, dangerous boy. for Pat. That'd be dangerous. <laughs> That's why he didn't get the credentials so much. They couldn't <laughs> afford to put that many cheesesteaks out for Patrick. <laughs> my, my, my. We josh you, Pat. I know you're busy as heck this week with all the wrestling going on and everything going on. Uh, I have a few. Uh, but if it's from uh, yesteryear, I have nothing of a uh, of thing. I even have summer lacrosse cards. I have a bunch of Victoria Shamrock cards that uh, have been uh, given to me by, uh, um, well, out west. Really cool stuff. Um, we have a uh, we have a guest, guys. Oh. I don't know if he's going to make it on here or not. It's Mentioned cheesesteak, and all of a sudden, oh, all of a sudden, he just straight <laughs> up, does he? he mentioned <laughs> cheesesteak, and here's the guy. He is. Yeah. In between bites. He's a, he's <laughs> not, he's not, he's not like he didn't get the cheesesteak. <laughs> it looks like Pat's uh, internet is uh, running like mine normally does here. <laughs> Slow and Hello? I can hear you, Pat, but you're yeah, yeah. on screen. It's like the uh, the Lord is speaking to us. Oh, there he is. Oh, oh man. man. You're back. Oh, he's oh, gone. He's gone. <laughs> I think uh, maybe sign off and come back on and uh, we'll see where we go from there. Um, While we're uh, – and he's back again. Any better, Matt? He's got the same look on his face, though. <laughs> he's got that look at the wings head at the last five minutes of the game. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> I uh, take a pot shot. I'm sorry. Um, while Pat gets this together, why don't we get uh, get together with the Rochester and New York thing and uh, T combines uh, continues to amaze with four goals, five assists as Riptide improve their playoff chances with a big road win. Um, as T goes, right? Yep. Why don't we look at the highlights and uh, see exactly where this went right for New York and where this went wrong. For Rochester because it doesn't get any easier for Rochester. They got Toronto in Toronto well, in Hamilton next week. So let's have a look at the highlights. Now to T. Back near side. Taken there by Keel. Far side. The shot by Teedy scores. Over to Kia looking. Steers it across to T. In front of the net. The shot he scores. What a pretty feed. T to O'Connor. A right arm save by Dunkerley. Nice job by Dunkerley holding his ground. Fed in front to Smith. He shoots and this time he scores. Just over six to go here in the second. Lansbury gets free, shoots and scores. Kiernan to Matisse. Near side to T, looking for the hat trick. Shooting, he scores, and he's got it. For New York, sundown, near side, Matisse. Back in the slot, the shot, he scores. And O'Connor scored the goal, and then you see the extracurricular stuff going on as Tyler Biles, he cut across the middle. Lanchbury picks it up. 
Grabbed by Knight. Knight shooting. He scores. Curtis Knight. Flip pass up top. That's grabbed by Fields. Getting away. Looking. Feeds it in front. The shot. He scores. And Waters buries it. And that's point number 100. And that one is played on ahead. And here comes New York. Breakaway opportunity. In on goal. The shot. He scores. Mitch Wild. That's a 10th shorthanded goal that Rochester has given up this season. That is worst. Picked up by Turner Evans to McConvey shooting. That's knocked down. Lansbury shoots and scores. All right. Well, first of all, let's talk about the good news. <clears throat> Ryland Hartley is back in the uh, Rochester lineup. Um, I am happy and I'm confused. I yeah. I'm a little bit concerned, <laughs> is what I am. Yeah, I was going to say concerned. I'm more confused. concerned than confused. Um, I say, um, talking with his mother a couple of weeks ago, um, I know he was back working and I know he was getting healthier. Um, I am just concerned with a uh, gentleman with that many concussions. Um, I'm very happy to see him back doing what he loves. Don't get me wrong. Um, I don't know if um, at the end of this season would have been the right thing to do or maybe a little bit long. Obviously, he got cleared, but um, maybe a little bit longer in my eyes would have been a better thing. Am I off board? No, I, I'm right with you, Gary. Um, even just to take the off season, just to figure out if this is the right thing to continue doing. Uh, I, and again, I'm with you right, right from the start, Gary. Like, I, I know he loves lacrosse. I know he wants to be back, but for his own, he's health, a champion. Let's not let's not get that wrong. Yeah, he's a Pinto Cup champion. No, I'm, he's got a great uh, legacy. He's got great. Um, uh, will, but health is health. It's a concussion. It's a brain injury. Yeah. It's very serious. And he should should be, and I'm sure he is. Don't get me wrong again. Um, but maybe you should take that off season and just figure out if this is the right thing to do for his health, for his long-term health. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I just, um, you know, Again, I am happy to see him back because I'm glad to see him getting healthy. Absolutely. I just think with a couple of games left in the season, um, Hutchcraft has done great so far. Yeah, has he been a stud at times? Uh, Buckham is, is you know confident to back up, competent backup. Yeah. Indeed, it, it's not dire that he gets in the net, and. God forbid that it comes just a hint too soon. That uh, that, uh, that worries me. And we've yeah, watched and, uh, you know, a number the, of players. The, I think the reason I said confused is is more just the fact that you know, you know, when I looked at the box score, it was like, okay, you put him in for all the twenty seconds of play where he faced one shot and it went in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, what was what was the point? <laughs> I'm, I'm, well, it was pull the goalie, and he's quicker into the net yeah. than Buckham. That's, that's the only thing I can see. Of, I just don't understand why he dressed. But um, I say obviously he was cleared. But um, when you have a history of that, shouldn't you that be clear? Even now, when you're cleared, I would still, yeah, sit back and just think, uh, is this the right thing to do? Now, now, was Hutchcraft put on IR? Nothing that I've seen. For, for the I, game. Well, I think you only have uh, two two goalies, right? Maybe you give him the, maybe he had something to do. or you know, Short-term holdout, maybe. Just for uh, for a bit. Uh, yeah. I'd be more interested to see in Toronto um, who's, in the, who's on the bench. I will be very, very curious. Um, first off, being there for uh, pregame, and then seeing who uh, who doesn't dress, because um, there's nothing that doesn't surprise you. Nothing on the NL website about it. 
But uh, that took me a little off guard. I didn't expect that. And um, um, like I say, uh, mixed uh, mixed feelings on that one. And uh, not because I'm not happy for him being being healthy, because yeah. you know we've been praying for that. But um, man, it's maybe a little concern for long term health, like you said. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, Eduardo really got that. It's not a concussion; it's multiple concussions. Well, exactly. True. Yeah. And we're all we're all shocked to see him in there. And uh, yeah, like I say, obviously there's uh, a lot more um, to it than we know. And um, obviously, the uh, the team, the team doctors, management, everything else is in on it because you're uh, you're not going to throw away, uh, a, you know, let let alone a career, but uh, everyday life multiple concussions that's well, that's why i say long-term health right it's maybe it feels fine now but again they're brain injuries right We're just down the road uh yeah you just you, you gotta be know, ever right? so careful about that yeah um getting to the game though um jeff t jeff t jeff t jeff t and then when you're not watching him Stephen q yeah. doing Stephen keo ish things another highlight real goal you know, but New York puzzles me also because they do it. It's, it's it's like it's second nature for a while, and then it's like they've never done it before. The consistency just isn't there. And if by some way a defense is able to contain T to six points, four points, um, there goes the New York offense. Kind of similar to Buffalo, hey? Like, if you can kind of even shut down Keo so he can't feed Teat. Yep, or O'Connor for that matter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. one of them. Just throwing a wrench in there somehow. Um, Teat's going to get his points. So it's about limiting his points. Yeah. He's just so good. And I say I've watched him since he's been a young boy. And he's just get better and better and better. And the most accurate shooter I've seen ever. Well, I was going to say that one goal he was – Stepping backwards when he took the shot, like, yeah, how, yeah, who does that? Like, and it doesn't matter, he can, he can have a misfire that's off the ground, and for some reason, it finds the, it just finds yeah. the net. You know, great players have you know all kinds of ways to score. You know, just you go back through the decades and you'll see that. But you know, this is finesse because he's not a big guy. It's funny, we, um, Brent and I were talking uh, talking about, you know, the gates this morning. And um, did you want to pay the price as a defenseman and get run over and he's still going to score? Or are you going to move out of the way or whatever, you know? Whereas Teat, uh, his finesse and accuracy and technique and God-given skill, and it all rolled into one package. I don't know. And uh, the, the best is yet to come with him. Could you imagine him on a team where, well, put him on, put him on Buffalo, put him on Toronto, where there's other options that they can't double team him. And he's that free. Yeah. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the numbers? <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of having to carry a house every game, you know, but uh, it's funny. I, I think back Troy accordingly and I were sitting and uh, Jeff T was still playing junior for Brampton and we were at the track and um, accordingly looks at me and goes, it's just like watching Gretzky because he's got such good vision of the floor and he can see the hit coming that he's able to just maneuver enough that they don't get him flush, which is why he never gets hurt. Interesting. And that was a number of years ago. He's only gotten smarter and bigger now. And all the other skills have been honed to what they are to the nth degree. So can you imagine in a couple more years when he's, you know, fully rolling? You know, he's going to eclipse a lot of numbers yeah. real soon. Yep. But, uh, Man, I just look at, uh, you know, if he had the opportunity to play on some of these other teams, you know. I think um, we just had the help. Yeah. Well, look at uh, John Grant when he moved over to uh, 
to uh, Colorado. Yeah, after after the Rochester years, and so many other things that went. The the numbers just were, you know, Colin Doyle coming back to Toronto, and uh, in the uh, 2010 2011 years, when you know Billings was young, Stefan LeBlanc were young, both uh, Rookie of the Year candidates, uh, as well as you know Cam Woods, Casey Beerens, and all the rest of those guys. Uh, that were that won the championship in 2011, and you take a look at the points that he was able to accumulate because they couldn't double team him or triple team him like he was over in San Jose when he was with the Stealth because he was the firepower there. And you know, I I, I reckon that to something like T if he had that ability. It just it's mind boggling, yeah, what he can do. But uh, you know, we'll see uh, if they can stay consistent. Uh, they can be a uh, a real, real force to uh, be hampering uh, some other teams' uh, championship aspirations, shall we say? Certain teams, I think, other teams don't want to play. New York on a good day, Buffalo on a good day, are teams that a lot of teams want to stay away from. Yeah where they might want to take their chances with uh, any of the other five that are left over. Just putting that out there is something to, something to think about and maybe chat before the, uh, before the playoffs uh, commence. Once we have a better clue of uh, who's going to play who or who's even in the damn thing. <laughs> Cause even that's uh, clear as mud still. All right, let's go over to uh, Georgia and uh, Vegas. And, of course, Georgia clinched with this victory. And Jackson leads the way with four goals. The Swarm clinched a playoff berth. That's something we haven't heard in a long time, eh? Jackson with four goals. Yeah. Yeah. Jackson leading the offense. You know, it's uh, it's been interesting. When Georgia's had a tough time, um, pieces of their offense have stopped also. And Jackson was a big part of them winning. And when his part of the offense dried up, uh, they were starting to have a tough time, relying totally on Andrew Q and Lyle Thompson. But, uh, you know, if they have that back in, as well as a couple of the others, Seth Oaks and um, Brian Cole, um, this will be a, uh, a real juggernaut um, at the right time. So this could be a very interesting playoff for – you know, it's always interesting, but I, I have a spocky eyebrow that raises every time I look at uh, different scenarios and who's going to meet up with who and who's getting the hot and who's getting healthy and to see what kind of homework has been done. And then it starts going into coaching staffs. Let's look at the highlights here and then we'll get back into this game. But outscored nonetheless. About 11 scored for a ball game and given up for a fair. Bounced in. 1-1. One, one. Oaks picks up the loose ball. Seth Oaks, two consecutive games without a point. Speaking of collecting points, it's Captain Clutch himself, Andrew Q. Jack Hanna in the middle. Give off. Good luck and score. Zach Greer, who that's in. Here we go. Little, little transition break. Wait a minute. Thompson scores! LT4! Yeah, you know who that was? That was Seth Oates. Belt shot in! Hey, hey, look who this is! Three on the year, is that right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Goaltender assists are up across the league. At least it feels that way. The athleticism off the charts of late. Speaking of athleticism. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. We'll bring a one-man advantage for the homeboys in blue. Bounce shot in. Shane Jackson. Doing that. Seth Oaks has scored a goal. He had him scored in a couple of games. Lyle Thompson, three points in the first half. Q! In effect on the five-minute. Five Another 
Bruin with Malmstead. They'll get two on the penalty, and we're leveled at 8-8. Eight eight. Great luck. Save made, put back, and highlight reel type stop. By Cole, up to Q. Andrew, an expert at these long shots. He gets off to Cole. Brian will rip it and score! Holy smokes! Of course, something cataclysmic would have to happen, frankly, for Georgia to not make the playoffs in some way. Charlie Bertrand goes right over the top. 11 and 4 was their record. Second place in the division. That was a team that was trending up, however. Q gets one through. Captain clutches on the hat trick, and his team leader finished that year at nine and nine. Played a famous game in this building for Georgia Swarm fans. That one bounced in by Shane Jackson. It's up to a three-goal lead. That's what it takes, right? Did it get through? Yes, it did. Shane Jackson. How in the world did that one get through, Kells? And there you have it. And all the names we're talking about, check all the boxes. Seth Oaks, yeah. Brian yeah. Cole with a couple of beauties. These are names that have been missing when they weren't winning. And names yeah. that were predominantly on that score sheet when they were. It can't just go through Lyle. Um, what I'm noticing, though, is that that offense is being spread around beautifully there. Um, Vegas. A lot of upside. Um, Bertrand looked better. Um, a lot more uh, um, in sync. But they're still a, they're still a level away from where they need to be. Yeah, De definitely, definitely. I mean, they, you know, this game, they, they 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 tied up the game at eight. You know, late in the third quarter, uh, and. You know, I, I thought, I, I, yeah, well, yeah. I, I, I thought, I thought that was, I thought that might actually be the turning point for Vegas to, to, to steal that game. I had actually picked Vegas to win. I, you know, Bombary picks up a, a five minute major and Georgia kills about four minutes and 10, 15 seconds of it. And then <laughs> Vegas strikes with two quick goals and ties the game at eight, you know, at the end of the third, you know, I, I thought, yeah. uh, I thought there yeah. was a chance, you know, uh, the, I guess the other things that stood out to me are, you know, obviously it hurt them to, to lose Zach Greer to an injury sometime in the second quarter there. Um, you have to wonder if, uh, <laughs> if that kind of stalled the offense a bit and, uh, you know, uh, Jack Hanna had six assists, but couldn't find the back of the net. So, you know, that, that's going to be one of those things kind of going forward, you know? Yeah. It, it's, yeah. He, he's going to be that guy on the right side that they're, you know, going to demand, you know, two to three goals a night out of. And I Question guess just kind of looking at this high, sorry, I was just going to say just from those highlights too, um, I know we brought it up before, is Landon Kells the answer in net? Those looked like some soft goals that got by him, some that he probably would want back. Question for you guys. Is Sean Williams the right guy for this job now? He's had a couple of years to try and mold and shape this team. I love Sean. I love what he does with the juniors. I know he's a great coach. I know he's a great guy. I know he's a motivator. I know all of that. I've watched him in action for years. Is he the right guy for this to do both jobs? We're talking about it with Paul Day. Uh, is he right for both jobs? Or should he concentrate on one or the other? Uh, I guess let me counter with how many coaches in the league right now are both head coach and GM. There's probably about four or five of them, right? Glenn Clark, right. Paul Day, uh, Williams, uh, Patrick Merrill. You count Derek Keenan. He's a co-head coach. <laughs> Uh, I guess I guess we'd call it. Yeah, let's call yeah. it separate just for the That's pretty argument. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, like Tavares, I think is probably considered an assistant GM in Buffalo, but which is ironic since Tucker is assistant coach and GM. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think most people just consider him the head coach. So, um, I'm sure there's someone else we're missing somewhere. Uh, Anyways, um, I'm just curious. Um, do, does Vegas need to look at something different, or do they just hold on and hope they draft in a in a pretty deep draft? I I I think. I think you need to. I think you need you need to keep him. Uh, and He's trying to go a different direction. Yeah. Where he got re- Reinhold. I, know, I see where um, Gary's coming from. I think you need to keep him. I'm just. I mean, for me, this is his, cause this is really this is his first head coaching job in the NLL, right? And maybe it is too much at this point in his career coaching at the be, pro yeah, that's, level. That's, that's a good point because yeah. I mean, everyone else we mentioned has you know more head coaching experience than than he does uh you know but... Vegas right now is getting decent decent attendance but um if the team doesn't do any better it's really hard to sell a team that's in the bottom um bottom seven in the league perennially um first couple of years sure it's still an expansion team yeah we're growing come grow with us Eventually, that gets old, and people want winners. You see it in Saskatchewan, Sean. Oh, yeah. You need to market a winner. It's not nearly as easy to market a me- mediocre or rebuilding team yeah. to a, uh, a group that's not always in the same area that have to make an effort to get to a game. And that's the Vegas landscape as well. And I don't think they want to paper the house. And right now, uh, they're the cock of the walk, as uh, far as I've heard, for in-game and in-game presentation. And um, making uh, visiting fans feel good. Everything I've seen and heard yeah. has been spectacular about it. I would hate to see that change and hate to see that become an emptier place when it doesn't have to be. So... Um, do we leave well enough alone or is there, you know, you give them one more, one more draft and a uh, year at it before something's got to be done sooner or later. Yeah. I, th- I think you need to give them at least one more year. Yeah. Just and, and, yeah and if you're going to take yeah. something away, you know, I think it needs to be, I think it needs to be GM responsibilities that's kind of my thought was and, too. Not, and not the head coach. And that's just coming from, that's coming from the perspective of the, all the talks we've had about, you know, people want, you know, people in Philly wanting to fire Paul Day, people in Rochester wanting to fire Mike Hazen. Who is going to replace them? Your coaching yeah. pool is 10 times smaller than the goalie pool, which we always talk about is. Well, we went through that last week and we actually smaller. found a number of names, right? And a name that we didn't uh, mention that we did, that I came up with also was. We talked about Darius Kilgore, but Rich Kilgore as well. Yeah, yeah. That uh, that came up. Um, so there's there is a handful of guys. It's whether they want to commute. Um, I really don't think Cordingly is in that pool. Um, Cordingly um, was happy to get out of coaching in Buffalo and become an assistant GM. That's why it shocked me when he uh, went over to Vancouver. The Vancouver job, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah which was uh, actually an assistant job before all the changes happened and then he became the coach and then uh well and then he went over to calgary with uh with sanderson and uh sanderson yeah so I'm, I'm, not, of, I'm not really sure yeah. and speaking of vancouver Miloski would be another one who's head coach and gm yeah yeah so and again another guy that comes with a ton of experience that yeah. maybe sean doesn't have and again that's the thing too if you're looking at the coaching pool maybe if like the killigors aren't interested in coaching or commuting anymore Again, you're probably going to go back to who are those junior coaches that are going to make that jump into their first NLL. So you're back in the same situation again, right? Right. right. So, yeah, so really well enough alone, I guess. But, um, again, um, the the, uh, the rope has to be getting shorter at this stage. It's three years in now. So you give them another year, four years. We're talking about five-year plans, usually. So we're coming to the end of that. Yeah. So let's see. All right, let's move on to uh, Calgary, Saskatchewan 2. 
part two. A little more feisty of a game. Oh, yeah. Um, well, man drops a hat trick to lead to rush to the split of home and home uh, in a battle of the prairies. Um, all right, let's watch the uh, highlights and uh, we'll come back. Cross for Walter. Walter has some room to shoot. Dips around Cowley's back for Wengrenick. Wengrenick inside. Cowley. What's up, brother? Cam Wengrenick has his third of the season. Zach Manz is in the corner. Does it on the shot clock. Manz on the roll. Kicks it out for Church. Church inside. Keenan five holes scores. The captain. Stingswood five hole. And the rush are up by three. And a cook now. 22 goals on the season. Didn't like that hack he got. Swim move around Bell to the net and he scores. A beauty by Cook and the Roughnecks have three. Set up just over nine minutes to go here in the opening half of play on co-op field. Robert Church, Zach Mann's up top, flips it. Keenan over to Church, quick stick scores. Tick, tack, toe. And Robert Church on the power play has his second of the game. You're going to commercial, but thought, thought you'd get a sip of water here, Cody, but I guess not. Mike Triolo up top. Jared Smith will stay in play. Triolo, far side scores. It's the 6'8 sniper who puts one under the bar. Right down the middle. Defenders let him walk down Main Street. He misses the mark. Took there goes Messenger the other way, though. Three on one. Messenger, flip back. Bell takes it and he scores. Keegan Bell's got his third of the season. Shot up high. Zach Manns with it. Over for Robert Church. Church had six points in the opening half. Church back for Mance. Little inside move to the net, and he scores. Count it. Two for number two in Saskatchewan. His 11. David Dixon will trail him. Dixon scored in the opening quarter. Down for Pinks. Now it's King. Got himself free out in front and he scores. Perfect finish by Jesse King. He's a member of Team USA at the World Championships this fall. Kazevdikov put it on goal. Del Bianco made the sink. Now it's an outlet for Shane Simpson. Simpson picks it up on a breakaway and he scores. Shane Simpson tucks one home for his 16th of the season. Church is going to have to grab it off the wall. Four to shoot. Man's inside. Oh, paint the top corner green. Throw those hats. Zach. Okay. Throw those hats, Zach. Okay. Well, of course, um, this time around, quicker start. Just before we get rolling, let's listen to Quinlan and Zach Mans in a press conference. What are your overall thoughts on how the team just bounced back tonight? Yeah, we said we needed to play desperate, and we played desperate. And so, um, again, our, our start was crucial, and we had a really good start. We did a good job um, with our game plan and shooting the ball. Uh, and then we never really took our foot off the gas. So uh, I think that's probably our best 60 of the season, and we, we desperately needed to, to keep our lives, uh, our, ourselves alive. I'm not sure well the tie break situations but uh pretty much have to win out now i couldn't tell you i mean we're going to play the one in front of us there's probably some scenario that we could maybe make it in at eight and ten but our our goal and our our mindset is to to, to win out and so um we'll just worry about san diego next week um we got a, we got a tall task and we're excited for it we got the top two teams in the league and uh we we feel like we can play with anybody and um, we're happy to be able to be in control of our our, our destiny. So um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna worry about San Diego, and then we'll worry about uh, Toronto in two weeks. From your point of view, uh, what was the difference from last night compared to tonight? Yeah, I, I really, you know, I thought we played well last night. Obviously, um, we struggled to finish the ball. I, I think anytime you you get 62 on net and 90 some towards the goal you, you can't knock the effort um I, I think we were just a little bit better in terms of our details that, that would be it in terms of shooting the ball you know specific assignments defensively uh frankie was awesome so again it, it was you know we, we we had 24 hours to regroup and go through some video and, and make some adjustments and credit to that group in there because uh they did everything we asked and more talk about uh, next things coming up um still mathematically still have a chance what's the message moving forward the message moving forward is to start on time and to 
play as a you know like a desperate team. And so um, when we do that, we're really good. So that that's what we're we're going to be doing. Perfect. Thank you. Zach, it was a big game. How did you feel uh, about the performance from the team? Big bounce back performance. Yeah, you know, I thought we were uh, we were due for a good performance. I thought our previous game against them, I thought we put together a pretty strong effort. I thought if we shot the ball better, I think we maybe would have had a little bit of better luck. But we were going into this game with the exact same mindset as last game: get through the middle, work hard, and just do all the little things right. And it worked out for us in the end. What do you think was the difference tonight versus last night? Honestly, just hitting our shots, right? We put over 60 on Delops last last game and didn't score that many. And I think we shot with a purpose early from the start, and it showed on the scoreboard. How important was it to get a good start tonight? I, it's, it's, I think it's the most important thing in this league is having a strong first five minutes and then just letting the game progress after that. What's your thought on special teams uh, shorthand and power play? Look like you guys are doing a little bit better this time around. Yeah, you know, that's that's been a focus for our group in the last couple of weeks. We we haven't been great um, throughout the season, but this is the perfect time to kind of dial in those things. There you have it. You both said that, right? Quick starts. Yep. Quick starts. Yep. If these, these slow starts are killing, I watch it with a number of teams. Killing them. So if they're on the ball, <clears throat> get to these goalies early. They're susceptible. I was going to say this game. This game shows what would have happened the night before if they could have got to Dubs earlier. Because I, I think Del Bianco, like other than Del Bianco, the Russia really outplayed them in Calgary. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just they couldn't find an answer to them. Young team. Yeah. Young team making mistake and weren't able to capitalize. Um, second time around. Mm. Maybe learn something from the night before, change a few things, and call Calgary a little bit flat-footed. Yeah. Also, we're a lot feist here. Um, they weren't pushovers at all. And I think that got Calgary off your game a bit, which opened up a little bit more floor. Yeah, well, this is the kind of game the Saskatchewan needs to play. This rush offense is very dangerous when it can get going. Um we're talking about Mark Matthews. The other guy in that trade was Mans. He probably had one of his best games in a rush uniform. He's had a career Looked like season the year where he had, I think, four hat tricks in a row. And he couldn't miss. And yeah. He's got such a great shot. That's the one thing I always admired when he was playing in Toronto. He's got such a powerful howitzer of a shot. And it's accurate. So if he's able to extend his arms and get these things flying, look out. Because he'll pick corners like T. It's just 100%. there's times when he just he, his positioning and where he is is his own he's a, he's his own worst enemy at times. Or he can't get his arms extended because of where he's situated. Sometimes he has to you know readjust before he just fires. Yeah, and if he can do that and be that much of a, a catalyst. Then the other guys open up too. Well, that's the thing. Like looking down this lineup, I mean, the talent is there. You know, Clark Walter can score. Um, when Dodds on the floor and he's making right decisions, there's times where I feel he's a little hesitant. He can score. We know he can score. Uh, Mans can score. Church, Keenan, um, Koznikov, he can score. Triolo's had a great year. Like there's talent there. Right. Right. I'm just putting it all together, right? <laughs> And that's just time. And it is and a rebuild. Yeah. <clears throat> but I think um, the two guys who are the best coaches for this is Keenan and Quinlan, who, yes, they want results, but yes, are also patient. And yes, are also good to help instead of criticize the mistakes. So these guys can grow. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of hope in there. Um whether this is a, a playoff where they can make some noise or get into the playoffs and make noise, um, time will tell. A couple of breaks here and there. But uh, they have a rough schedule to the end. Yeah. And even if they do, uh, maybe they're not making it far. But, again, if, this is a young team that, as you said, give it time. I think even a year or two down the road, this could be a dangerous team. Right. Right. And you still have Levi Anderson coming. 
It was going to be a huge cog in that offense. Yeah. Mike, what do you think? I agree with everything Sean said. I mean, it's, they're, they're, you know, as much as they may be in a quote unquote rebuild right now, you know, that most of these, the core on both sides of the ball is going to stay together, you know, for the next five to seven years, probably. Mm -hmm. So, so the team is, is going to be dangerous, you know, um, you know, I think they're dangerous enough right now that, you know, they, they could steal a couple of wins here and, and, and force a tie, you know. I mean, I, <laughs> I would probably take a little heat of, on this, but with San Diego coming up, San Diego is not going to want to get a track meet with this Saskatchewan team. No, I don't at think all. I don't think they can compete with that. No, young legs against against beaten up legs this year. You know, not even saying that they're they're older, but they're pretty been beaten uh, to a pulp um, in their wins, finding ways to win. And they haven't done it the easy way. So that takes a toll. And, and we've seen what happens if a team's get caught on their heels with this rush team. They but it's also right you don't team. want anything to happen to your players going into the playoffs, a couple of weeks out of the playoffs. There's another reason to stay away from doing things like that. True. Yeah. So, you know, it's preventative, which is, you know, you don't want to be reactive with something like that, especially something that may affect you. Uh, a couple of weeks later in the playoffs. And, uh, you know, the last thing that San Diego wants is another uh, upset early exit. And uh, if it becomes because uh, they were trying to keep up the speed of Saskatchewan on, on a game that didn't matter to them too from the end, um, that's not a good, uh, that's not a good look. So we'll see how that plays out. Yeah. We had one more game of this marathon weekend. Uh, that happened this afternoon. Um, I uh, was able to catch the second half of the game and uh, still shook my head. I thought after Paul Day's, um, after his press conference, his emotional press conference, that this Philly team would have gone through a wall. And um, they uh, they gave him about 38 minutes. Um, maybe if they gave him 42 minutes, uh, this is a uh, a win in their pockets, but um, there's still things that, uh, that just aren't right there. Um, just, you know, Jason Knox scores four, has four assists uh, for the big home win. Um, let's look at the, uh, the highlights and uh, see where it went right and where it went wrong. 11 goals the last five games. First one out every game prior to the start. A little behind the back. Crawford oh, looks, scores! Up with Coach Day before the game, he talked about how Panther City likes to push transition. Right. They're doing a great job. Oh, oh, and they get Day Mood. The quick move by Blaze Reardon. For two, three minutes to go here in the first. Quick feed again of Will Malcolm tried to feed the middle. They're still able to keep control of the ball. Great defense by Philadelphia. Malcolm with four on the shot clock. Shot score from the left side. We have the Malcolm to Malcolm brother connection against Philly where their opponents, when they've scored first, have gone one for eight. So, oh. And a shot score go. by Catoni. Lead to three. That's going to help him a ton going into the second half. Again, we talked about Mitch Jones, Holder Catoni, Joe Retzikaritz. Very powerful offense. They can do it. Shot score. There's one of them. What a rifle from Joe Retzikaritz getting his second of the afternoon. The start is already with a couple of goals this afternoon. Nice ball movement by Philadelphia. A little behind the back. Shot score. Loose backhand goals. LeClaire, no place to go. Good defense, Panther City. Inside of eight on the shot clock. LeClaire still looking. This time he rifles it, gets his own rebound behind the back. Oh, oh, what wow. a goal! How about that pass, though, from LeClaire that set everything up? And that was an incredible job by Wagner and just his awareness to get around those Panther City defenders. Tried to sneak one in, and the game is tied. 
50 seconds left in the power play for Panther City. And that's really who they need to get the ball back in their stick is Jason Knox. Quick oh, shot low. You say it, he'll do it. This season. And he's done a great job clearing it and pushing it in transition for Panther City today. Crawford has to give it up. Little fake oh. shot. Score! Jonathan Donville. What a fake by Donville. Really? Okay. That last goal by Donville. Where's the defense? He's alone. Yep. It's a tie game. A couple of minutes left in the game. Same story, happen. eh? Same old that story, eh? Can't yeah. happen. There was another goal where they're, they're talking about how great the Philly defense was, except for one thing. You had three defensemen on two Panther City guys. The ball gets flipped to the third guy. He's alone. Yep. Guess what? He scores. These things are killers. Did Philadelphia play well enough to win today? Yes. Yes, they did. But it comes back down to defensive breakdowns. And the defense and Higgins did not play that badly. You know, most of the time, that would have been enough for them to get a, a few more goals and win. But you're taking penalties in the last four minutes of the game. I was going to say, sorry, Gary. I was going to say, in general, uh, Panther City had 10 power plays. 10. How can you win a game when, you know, penalty minute-wise, you're nearly over a quarter in the box? <laughs> uh, 100 people in attendance rest out those 100. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I get that. But the baseball umpires yeah. probably came into to refting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's what I mean. The, these penalties, you, you, when you see that kind of um, that kind of refing, um, you need to be walking on eggshells. And I know if it's not your game, that becomes a very difficult thing. But um, um, I don't know. A penalty in the last couple of minutes, unless it's an assault, that's, that's just robbery. Yeah. That's determining the game yeah. in a tie game. Yeah. But but the other issue here is um, the refs took none of the 66 shots that were uh, fired on. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. And that goes I'm back again to what Gary was saying. Oh, I'm, just, play I'm, not, I'm not I'm not letting because we've been talking but... about this all season. It yeah. just you know they they allow so many shots and. But it's also yeah, it goes what, back to what Gary missed said: missed assignments. Yeah. How do you leave Donville alone with just a couple of minutes left in the game when he's a sniper? And sure enough, he picks the short side. I just it just yeah doesn't it doesn't jive with me. Um, you know, Malcolm, you're leaving him open. He went, to, you went to the two guys in the center and it just doesn't jive with me. I know they're all trying to do everything they possibly can, but they're trying to overdo things. You know, you can't hit the 11 run home run. You can't score the three point goal. We just talked about this in other games. Everybody has to do their job. Not everybody else's job. I can't do yours. I can't do his. Hmm. Yeah. I can see that too. I can see that too. I just, um, the, uh, after day's, um, press conference last week, my big thing was, uh, that Phil, I, I picked them this week to win. Um, that they were going through a wall for him. And I saw more life today than I had in any of the, uh, the last few games, especially. But um, I guess Saskatchewan, I think, uh, came, came to mind the most where I saw it was lifeless. Yeah, This is the opposite. I can't really blame um, the energy of the team. Um, I just think there are a number of factors involved in this one. Because again, I um, Panther City is good, not great. I just uh, I don't want 
the press clippings to be put them here. I don't. I think they're here. No. And it's you're talking about the defense. We've been harping on it all year. It's just, it's the same problem over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Oh, how? What, what's the answer to that? Yeah, but there has to be a way around that because um, I've seen some uh, some strange officiated games. Um, the Halifax Toronto one comes to mind, where neither team was happy by the end of it. Um, ironically, I think Halifax was angrier at the refs than Toronto. And uh, you know, even when I rewatch it, I, I, I sat there and I just scratched my head on it. I'll, I'll rewatch the uh, the Philadelphia game tomorrow and uh, see what I can uh, see what I can look at and uh, what I can deduce from what I what I've seen that other than the obvious and look for certain certain little things on either side. You know, it's not to be picking on any any one team in, in particular, but um, it's just um, just that there has to be something. Um, it's almost almost to be a forgettable. Uh, for forgettable kind of a a year when it comes to that, but um, why don't we have a look at the uh, at the standings and um, work our way from that? So if we look right now, obviously Toronto's sitting in first, thirteen and three. San Diego twelve and four. That's still up for grabs, depending on a few things we've talked about. Um, clinched now is Albany and Georgia at 10 and 6 and 10 and 7, respectively. Uh, Buffalo is sitting in fifth, 9 and 7, but Halifax right on their tail at 9 and 8, and New York at 8 and 8. And then we have Panther City, Calgary, uh, and Saskatchewan and Vancouver, all with seven wins. Panther City with seven. Oh, that wins. needs to be updated. Panther City's 8 and 8 now with the win yeah. over Philly. 8 and 8. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. So, uh, in actuality, Panther City would be in number seven right now, and New York would be the eighth seed. Okay. Panther City has a tiebreaker on New York. So, All right. And then um, we're looking at Vegas has been eliminated. <laughs> yep. And Philly has been eliminated. Philly would be eliminated. Philly eliminated yeah. Now as well, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And Col- I mean, Col- so Colorado. Colorado's on the cusp. There, but, yeah, they're pretty much – they're more yeah, or less. They're, they're yeah. on the cusp. Next week is uh, – is, uh, well – that's a D-Day. Yeah, you kind of look at that 10 loss mark, right? Um, 10 may get you. It's going to be yeah, eight, 8 and 10 isn't getting you in this playoffs. No. It's, it's, no, it's, no, like no, said, it's entire yeah. I, I think I, you're I, looking at 9 and 9 at the most, but yeah. So, But they, do have, a, they do have a double header, so they're, they're playing uh, their home against Philly, and then they're at Las Vegas. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, seven and nine, uh, you still have you still have a shot. Um, it's getting less and less of one, but um, I wouldn't even call that a um, a tragedy um, when you look at the uh, the seasons, the season this season, and watching Vancouver uh, develop oh, more into the Vancouver. team yeah. that they are uh, they're having. Um, looking at the uh, the upcoming games, you got Rochester and Toronto. Not an easy one for uh, for Rochester. Toronto still fighting for that. Uh, uh, they still have something to play for, fighting for first overall uh, for that clinch. Um, Sean's hoping it happens next week so that they can uh, maybe relax the week after. <laughs> Calgary into Buffalo um, again. That's uh, not an easy game on either side. Um, it's a track meet in my eyes. And, um, well, let's see, can Smith and Byrne, uh, can they uh, solve Delps? Yeah. Or do yeah. they let Delps uh, um, run wild? Again, Buffalo has to get to Delps early, right? That's exactly. Yep. And Buffalo is notorious for starting quick and then stopping and then restarting and then stopping. Uh, I think and a you, flow needs to yeah, happen. Yeah, so you have to be careful because if you give Delps any type of momentum – to get back uh, Buffalo it. starts really quick and Buffalo ends really strong. And in the middle, they can, uh, they can go to sleep for a while. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, we got Cal- um, San Diego in Saskatchewan. That'll be a big one. And like I said, it could be interesting. <laughs> like if Saskatchewan can turn that into a track meet, which San Diego doesn't want. 
Well, you know that uh, you know that the evil genius in uh, in Keenan and Quinlan uh, will be certainly working out plans how to uh, how to exploit uh, older legs late in the season. And do you think uh, Frankie will be playing with a chip on his shoulder a bit too? Oh, I'm sure he will be. I'm sure he will be. Yeah. But he needs to stay focused. Yeah. Uh, if he uh, loses focus, uh, they will ping shots from everywhere. They are that good. And that is my concern is where Chiliano struggles is kind of those more outside shots where yep. that's kind of what San Diego is. It's kind of a sniper team. They're not really going to come in close too much on you. Only like stops is going to do that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, guys like Berg, Leclerc, uh, they're Dunbar. They're all going to fire. Yeah. Burr back and fire. Doby will come inside a little bit. Um, but mostly fire from the side fire. of the net. Yeah. It's thoughts that'll uh, come in like a, a bull in a China stock. Anyways, um, Colorado plays Vegas. So um, that one is, uh, you know, up for grabs. <laughs> uh, they actually, so they actually play two on, fr- on Friday. They play Philly, Colorado. Uh, so, I missed that, did I? Yes, I did. Look at that. There it is. In Colorado. And, yeah. And that's a big one because, uh, again, um, well, that'll do. That'll the, the worst, the worst Col- yeah. yeah, the worst Colorado does. The better Philly's first round pick is. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Phil, Philly's going to want to win that game so that they can knock Colorado mm-hmm. down a peg. And yeah, yep. Now, the game that's circled on my calendar is New York and Vancouver. And if the Rock game uh, lets out when it does, I should be able to get home just in time to uh, catch this game in its entirety. Because uh, New York and Vancouver are two of the up-and-coming teams in this league. And I think that this is going to be one hell of an entertaining game. Over and above anything. And then uh, uh, for your entertainment value, also, Albany and Panther City. Which I put them about level right now. Maybe even a slight edge to Panther City because they have their systems in place. But Albany has to do something to right the ship. Four losses. You don't want to have a fifth loss in a row. How's Rochester about that? It's just too hard to uh, undig yourself out of the muck. Yeah, yeah, that's that's going to be big for for Panther City. They they need to they need to get that win because they follow up in week twenty one against Calgary. So <laughs> Eduardo's got six of his seven picks in already. <laughs> He missed the first one because I missed the first one. Yeah, and it's good. And it's going to be really a must win for Vancouver, too. You know, I, I mean. Well, they want to make the playoff. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. No, there's no off date for this. Yeah. And right. there, you know, that's not to say that New York can afford to lose that game, but uh, yeah, their last game is uh, home against Albany. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you also made a good point, too, Mike, this week that. Uh, at least for, from Saskatchewan standpoint, Panther City and Calgary still have to play each other. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. could play in their favor yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. got those, you know, uh, well, now that Panther City won, I mean, they're, they're not in that group. But, uh, you know, uh, had Philly won that game, we you would have had basically four teams tied for eighth place at seven to nine. Yeah. You would have had Panther City, Calgary, Saskatchewan, and Vancouver. Right. So... All right, let's leave it there. Uh, I just want to remind everybody, uh, the next two weeks, we will be at 11 a.m. on Sunday. Um, uh, One is for, uh, sorry, an event I have to be at in the evening. And the second week is um, I have to catch a plane to Prague. Um, They won't wait for me to finish the show. (laughs) So uh, 11 a.m. next week and the following week. Uh, Just a reminder that we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, we are on Instagram, we are on Thread, we are on YouTube. Um, Lots of things on all these pages for you to uh, enhance your lacrosse knowledge, stay up to date with everything that is happening. Again, I say it every week, we have our thumb on the pulse of the situation, and we are very proud to keep you up to date with everything that's going on everywhere. And uh, we have enough feelers out there that we are able to give you things up to the minute. So please check our Facebook page three, four, five times a day because the news is always changing and we have everything up there as quick as we can possibly get it to you. Uh, Please, again, go back and uh, 
Uh, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube page, please subscribe. If you have, please tell other people to subscribe. We're using it more and more to put more interviews, more pictures, more other things, more retro games, and more uh, tools uh, to keep you well-equipped in the lacrosse world. So we thank you again, week in and week out, for your patronage and sticking with us day in and day out. It is our privilege to give you everything that we can uh, in the world of lacrosse and all the traveling that we all do to get everything to you as quick as we can, most succinctly as we can. So we thank you again. Um, last words over to Sean and Moose Jaw. Yeah. And Saskatchewan here, we need a lot of help. So. <laughs> you can say a few prayers over there. Yeah. Be really helpful. <laughs> But the tractors are still there in case, and uh, Mike, your 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 coronation <laughs> and your parades are still all set That's up. Still like a, we're that's still nice yeah. now, so we're able to get some of these things uh, dusted off and ready. <laughs> Over in Connecticut, we have Muffler Mike with his last words, and they are. Uh, I'm just gonna take a rest, like Georgia and Halifax next week. They have buys. <laughs> Uh, Mike is busier than Jordan and Halifax. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously, you know, but, hey, listen, if you still are skeptical about the unified standings, um, please explain your, please explain your line of thought because this These season, are wild. This We're the final two weeks and there's still it, yeah, this season has been phenomenal and there, I mean, <laughs> You have 13 out of 15 teams still, still with a possible shot at, at, at playoffs. So, uh, thank you, Guido. We really appreciate you, uh, you chiming in and watching with us week in and week out. Really appreciate it, Eduardo. As always, thank you for your contributions yeah. with us and to us. Uh, I know you got a lot of things uh, on the go there, and we really appreciate all your hard work with us. Definitely. And uh, he's picked Colorado over Philadelphia. <laughs> Just to <laughs> give you the seventh. I'll have to keep that in mind when I'm putting the pickups together later this week. <laughs> uh, my, my thoughts are uh, I actually have an easy week of travel next week. I only have to drive to Hamilton. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with all the spare time I have in my, 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 my weekend. <laughs> oh, I know. I can do my regular stuff. Anyways, <laughs> it's been great. Um, I really enjoyed Albany. Um, I really enjoyed the people um, and everything else about it. I was actually surprised because I don't think the TV cameras do it justice. There were a lot more people there than I expected. And uh, it is a pretty good setup in there from the uh, parking right on into the uh, arena, uh, right on into everything in there. I wish they had more concession uh, merch places to have a look at. They have one set up on the one side so you know got to do laps to try and get there but uh um and the lineups because it's only one but um uh, other than that that's you know just small logistics uh as for anything else in there i really found it to be a very very well laid out uh system and building so and getting out of there was pretty easy too so um that being said um if you have a chance to get to your local arenas get there uh, support these teams. Um, you won't be disappointed. And I will be har harping on that all through the summer too with the MSL and WLA because these teams really do need your support. Um, and uh, you're going to see some phenomenal lacrosse. And especially now where everything is on the line. So please uh, give them a uh, uh, some support. Anyways. Until next week at 11 a.m. For Sean Slatt over in Moose Jaw, for Muffler Mike over in Connecticut, I'm Gary Groob in Toronto, and I wish you all, we wish you all, an excellent week. Keep your stick in your hands. And until next Sunday at 11 a.m., take care.